Okay. Uh, are we having fun today? Yes? Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you want another API and friends room next year? Yeah. 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 Cool. More large. <laughs> yeah. A bigger one. Bigger. Bigger one, right? Bigger, bigger. Yeah, yeah, totally. So this is our last talk today, uh, fortunately. And uh, it's going to be Evolving Your API Step-by-Step -step Approach by Nicola. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks to be here. Um, that's my third FOSDEM, as I mentioned. Uh, every year, I talk to a new in a new room. So last year, I was in the observability room, and not the year before because there was COVID, but the, year, the previous year, it was in the Java room. So I hope that next year, I will still be speaking in the API room. Let's see. Uh, I'm Nicola Frankel, nobody cares, and I have 35 minutes anyway, so let's skip. Um, so I assume you are here because um, you already have developed or you are planning on developing an API. And if you develop an API, you've got all the problems uh, of regular project management, like not enough people, stupid requirements, like changing requirements, yeah, no, not stupid, so let's forget for the recording, changing requirements. Um, and then you need to uh, model your entities, think about the relationship in your model and all this stuff. But then on top of that, you have REST principles. And so some REST principles most people agree on, but some none. No, nobody agrees on them. Or even worse, sometimes there is nothing in REST, like pagination. How do you do pagination? You have no clue. So you spend a lot of, lot of time trying, how do we do pagination? How other people are doing pagination? And so when the business comes to tell you, hey, your API is super successful, let's work on the next version, <laughs> you forgot about versioning. No, you didn't forget. No, you are smart. <laughs> I'm not that smart, so I forgot. So, eh. so in this talk, I would like to give you a, a, a couple of tips and tricks that you can apply as an afterthought, even if it would be better if you plan for them, but at least it, would, it could probably save your butt. So that's the initial situation. You have an upstream, an app, or whatever, and you've got a couple of endpoints, and people call them, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's my uh, first stupid French trick. You lied. So I'm asking for feedback, and people who dare give me feedback and tell them, no, you lied. No, that's probably not the initial situation. I hope that all of you have something in between. It might be a reverse proxy, probably. And my solution to this versioning problem is, okay, just set an API gateway instead of a reverse proxy. Okay, we have some time for questions. <laughs> um, so today I only have uh, 35 minutes, so I won't delve into the differences between an API gateway and a reverse proxy. Um, just let's say that it's, it's an, a reverse proxy on steroids and it's like focused on APIs. Uh, my general example is a reverse proxy is a technical component, so you have rate limiting and you consider every one of your consumers the same way. But now you have an API, and some customers might pay you to get a higher limit. And though it's like theoretically possible to set those rules into your reverse proxy, then it's in general not super feasible, especially because like reverse proxy were designed at a time where they didn't want any business logic in them. And so changing business rules frequently in a reverse proxy is not feasible. So for that reason, we have API getaways. Here, I list you a couple of API getaways. I will do the demo because there is a demo with Apache API 6 because, well, um, but actually you can use any of them, I hope or I believe. Uh, just two slides about API 6. Uh, it's an Apache project. Um, it's, well, depending how you look at it, either recent or not that recent. We became uh, a top-level project like four years ago already. Uh, it's based on the super popular Nginx uh, reverse proxy. I 
guess that most of you know about it. The biggest problem of Nginx, the open source version, is that every time you need to change the configuration, you need to switch it off and on again. And if it's the entry point into your information system, that's not super great, especially, again, because business rules might change frequently. Uh, so for, for this reason, there is something called OpenResty. Who, who knows about OpenResty? Not that many people. Um, so it, it's a, a Lua engine that allows you to change the configuration of the Nginx uh, uh, to ho hot reload it. So you don't need to switch it off and on again. The problem is it's, it's very similar to Nginx in its configuration and it might not be the best maintainable way to do that. So if you start to scale, then perhaps you want something that has more structures. For example, API 6, we offer abstractions should, uh, as routes, services, plugins, and likewise. So everything in API 6 can be related to a plugin. So let me get back to my solution. We introduce an API getaway, and now I will do a demo. So here I have, yes, I have a, a, a project, and I will docker compose up, and afterward, I will talk about it. And my Docker is like slacking. No, okay. So my project is the following here. Everybody sees it's big enough? Great. Um, so here I have API 6. API 6 stores its configuration in etcd. I, I hope everybody is familiar with uh, Docker Compose, right? Okay. Okay, um, etcd is a distributed key value store. Of course, here I have one node, it's a demo, but whatever. Uh, I have the dashboard, just because I can do some uh, graphical changes if I want. I have Prometheus because I want everything to be monitored. I have Grafana to show uh, the data in Prometheus. And then I have the old API and I have the new API. Normally I shouldn't already have the new API, I should have uh, only the old API, but it's Docker Compose and whatever. So now I can uh, do something, I will make it bigger, I can um, do a call, so I will curl local host 8081 and I say hello and wow, that's my old API and my new API is much better, so uh, just for you to know, uh, the old API is a Java Spring project, but I've re rewritten everything into Kotlin and it's much better. <laughs> so my idea now is how can I use the API getaway to uh, switch to a, a, a brand new version. So let's try. But here the problem is that I, it's not configured. So I need first to configure it. And for that, uh, we can do an API call to change the configuration of the API getaway. So here I try to be smart, I need to remove it. I, I didn't want to, to use curl directly, so I'm using a curl image. Um, here I'm using, so the uh, uh, endpoint admin routes of API 6 because, well, it's a very sensitive operation. It's uh, secured by an API key. Uh, it's not very secured because it's a default one, obviously. Um, there are many ways to secure it. The first one, change the default uh, admin key. It's a put, I put some data here, it's optional, but it's a great idea if you want to remember it. Here, the URI, mean if it matches the URI, then it will be uh, forwarded to this upstream. Ah, no, don't do that. Um, to this upstream here, this upstream I was a single node, which is stupid, but for the demo it's good enough. And here I, I want that I told you everything is monitored, so I have the plugin Prometheus. And if I run it, and if I curl it again, now it works. I'm back to square one. Great. Let's go a bit further. The first thing that I need to do is I need to version the API itself. So there are multiple ways to version your APIs. The first one, the one that I will use in this demo is because it's the most, most uh, visible and obvious one is path-based. So I will just add v1. There are other ways to do that, query parameter that I have never seen used in the wild, but it's cited el everywhere. Not a great idea, probably. Header-based, however, could be a good idea, either a custom one or this uh, um, accept header with the uh, vnd plus json v1. So that's another way to do it. Again, I will be using path-based. 
So I can do the exact same stuff that I did before, uh, but here I want to make use of the abstraction created by uh, Apache, offered by Apache API 6. So the first thing that I will do is I will create an upstream. So I will use another endpoint for that. So I will put this new upstream. Great. And then up here, I will create the plugin configuration. And my idea is that in the previous route that I used, every time I had to specify plugin Prometheus, plugin Prometheus, plugin Prometheus. I mean, how long is it going to take before somebody forgets to add the plugin? So I want to, the, the plugin to be by default. And that's the idea of this global rule. So here it says, OK, it will be applied everywhere, unless you disable it on a per basis. So here plugin Prometheus. And now I can create the version route. So I can reference the, the upstream ID that I've created before. And what I need to do also is I need to somehow remove the v1 prefix. Because if I just forward v1 slash hello, then the upstream will re re receive v1 slash hello and it only knows about hello. So that's not something uh, I want my upstream to know about. So here again, it's a, uh, it's a plugin. I will rewrite the request before I forward it. And here I have uh, created a plugin config so it can be reusable, which is stupid, but it's just to show you that here we can have some abstractions, store them and reuse them across routes and services. And normally, I don't know if I did that. Yeah, I'm talking very fast because I don't have that much time. And here it works again. Amazing. OK. But the problem is now that we have two routes, the inversion route and the version route. And people, especially developers, being creators of Abit, what is going to happen? Probably you will copy paste the inversion route in your next project. Yeah, I know. I, I've been a developer too. Um, so we need to tell people, hey, stop using the inversion route. But because you didn't plan for it, you have no way of contacting the consumers of your APIs. Because you didn't think about making them subscribe, and, or perhaps you didn't have time, or perhaps you wanted something free so that everybody would use your API. So the only thing that you can do is, well, tell them directly through HTTP. Tell them, don't use it anymore. OK, let's do that. That's quite easy, actually. So again, it's a plugin. So the first route, we will, so that's the inversion one. We add this redirect plugin. We say, no, don't use it anymore. And here, oh. It's not great. So basically, yeah, you broke all clients, which is a good lesson if you are consuming APIs to also observe the concept that not only if you are a provider, but also if you are a consumer. But you can tell me, hey, but we are very smart because this guy is very smart here. Hey, what we are doing, we are doing automatic follow. That's what you would have done, right? No, yeah. Um, the problem is just you, you just doubled your number of calls. So if you are running in the, in the cloud, congrats, you have doubled your budget. So again, even if you are doing auto redirect, uh, auto follow, just try to always, always observe your consumption of APIs. Next step. So my previous problem is that I didn't know how to contact people who were actually using my API. So the only way to do that in a, a way was to break them. Perhaps we could send them an email, but for, them, for that, we need them to register. Register meaning you need to give out your email address and re receive stupid marketing emails. Who likes that? There is always one person who likes it in every one of my talks. No, it, they are not there today. OK. Um, I don't like it either, but we like free stuff. So we need to provide them an incentive to register. 
And perhaps in that case, the incentive would be, okay, if you provide your email address, you are still using unlimited calls. If you don't, you can still use our API because I don't want to break you, but you will be rate limited. That's not a bad idea. And for that, there is no plugin. So what did I do? Because I'm a developer, I created my own plugin by copy pasting an existing plugin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, again? Not ChatGPT. Uh, I've used ChatGPT for this kind of stuff. Believe me, it's uh, uh, not great. So I copy pasted. I, I copy pasted the uh, rate limit count, and I just added my own logic. Because that I can do more or less. Yes, here. A anybody here is a Lua developer? You are a Lua developer? No. Okay. So I can show you the code because I'm not a Lua developer and. <laughs> I would feel very ashamed if there was one. <laughs> so basically, this is the code. And what I'm doing, I'm checking the header. I'm trying to use an other plugin called KeyAuth that I will show you just afterwards. And I will find if this user has been authenticated with KeyAuth. If the user has been authenticated with KeyAuth, then I just leave, like return here. That I can write. It's not closure, so it's quite readable if, even if you are not a Lua developer. Otherwise, I continue the rate limiting logic. And this is it. So I have the exact same parameters as in uh, the initial plugin. Basically, if I make w more than one request in a 60 seconds time window, uh, blah, 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 then I, uh, I return four to nine because the default is not great and I have a rejected, me rejected message. So let's try again. V1, V1. Hey, now I'm rate limited. Oh, that's too sad. So, of course, I need to provide a way for people to subscribe. That is outside uh, the scope of this talk. Uh, we have many, many ways to authenticate in Apache API 6, but here, since I didn't want to create any dependency, I'm using the most basic one, which is uh, key auth. Basically, it tells if in my request I have a header with name, API key, we value my key, then I will be authenticated as John Do. I can not do better. So I run it, or I, ah, I already run it, but it's fine. So I need to say header API key, my key. And now I'm not red limited anymore. Great. Um, 15 minutes, oh, I can show you the dashboard then. No, that's my next step, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, yes, API 6 dashboards. And of course, the password is not admin at all. <laughs> um, here you can see uh, all the routes that I've created. You can see the upstream that I've created. You can see the consumer John Do that I've created. Every time you can change, let's say you can view what is stored in etcd and change any data that you want. So I'm doing everything with curl because I'm the developer. But here, if you have like business users and you want to let, let, let them change a bit, then they can directly go there and, and do some stuff in the uh, GUI. Okay, that, that's pretty good at this point. However, we need to be, we need to go further, and at this point, we need to deploy V2, right? So, um, who here is doing unit testing? You are not. <laughs> no, no, you are. You are ops, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, integration testing? Less people, okay. Testing in production? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> okay, um, fun aside, even if you are doing unit testing, even if you are doing integration testing, no test can cover the whole scope of what your users will send in production. So you will. Sorry? 
you know I have a consulting company. <laughs> Let's talk afterwards. Um, and so you will test in production anyway, whether you want it or not. But we can try to limit uh, the, the um, let's say, the explosion uh, um, uh, perimeter of anything that happens badly. So in general, the first thing that people do is they do canary releases, which is a good idea. We will just do it afterwards because before doing canary release, we can do something a bit smarter. What we can do is actually we can like duplicate the load, send it to the V2, and just check the HTTP return code, and then like match them with the uh, return code written by the V1. And normally, that should be more or less the same. Hmm? And of course, we discard the result anyway. But still, it's the first step, I would believe. So there is a plugin for that called um, Proxy Mirror. And I have to say that I'm a bit proud about it um, because, uh, oh, sorry. Don't be afraid to give me feedback. Um, so I'm a bit proud about it uh, because when I started uh, to work on Apache API 6, there was a bug. And the problem is uh, you can, of course, add multiple plugins to a route and they are ordered by your priority. And the priority is hard-coded, which is more or less okay. The problem is in this case, the proxy mirror, this one, first uh, had higher priority. So first it forked the loads, Hmm? And then it removed the v1 prefix. But of course, the v2 already received the one slash hello, which was not great. So now you can actually change the priority of plugins. So that's what I'm doing here, so that now the rewriting happens before the mirroring. So uh, let's do a couple of them. It still works, amazing. <coughs> and now because everything is by default monitored, uh, 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 the API 6 sends everything uh, to Prometheus, well, not the other way around, that it exposes a route to Prometheus. If we go to Grafana, and we check, hey, hey. Hey, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, so I've like selected the, eh, black is not super great. Can you switch off the light, please? Okay. Thanks. Bit better? Not really. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so basically, I've selected the default uh, uh, Grafana dashboard for API 6, and I've added those two new widgets. And if you know, if you have uh, like done every uh, Grafana dashboard, you know how bad that is. So uh, I'm very proud of myself. Uh, and normally, you should see the same curves. Of course, the scales are not the same because, of course, the V1 has had many more calls than the, f the first one. But let's say that, hey, it looks the same, so we can continue. So the next step is actually to do, finally, the canary release. So if we can, we have many ways to do canary release. So first thing that we need to do is to create the upstream for the V2. So I call it with ID2, which is normal. Um, then we can do canary release. Uh, normally, the, the basic stuff would be, hey, we send X percent of the traffic to this new version, and then we increase it. Meanwhile, we observe that nothing breaks, right? Uh, you can also do it by header. You can also do it by IP, by uh, IP range, by whatever you want. Here, I've done the, the simplest one, plus I will just be 50-50, so that in the demo, I don't need to send thousands of requests to show you that one of them goes to the V2. So normally, if I run it, I'm not sure, I will do it again. Half of them, yes, will hit the V2. So we start with X percent and we increase, increase, everything is good. 
Great. That looks like it, but actually it's not the end. Because now we have two versions in parallel, and perhaps there will be three or four or five or whatever. And guess what? If you are an engineering manager, you know that many versions in parallel cost money. So you want to limit the number of parallel versions. So for that, you need to tell your consumers, hey, we will be removing or at least deprecating this endpoint, this version. Again, some of them might have subscribed. You can send them an email, but some of them might not. And for that, I found nothing else than an ITF draft that I think is deprecated itself now because nobody has been working on it since I think it's one year or two years, but still it's the best bet that I, can, I, I, I did find. Uh, there is a deprecation header, so it can be a Boolean or a date, which is very, very stupid. You should always be a date, right? Of course, in the demo, I use a Boolean because I'm super lazy, but that's something else. <laughs> Um, also, you have a link that points to the new resource that tell you, your, your consumer, hey, use it, use this one. And, and again, this is a very, very good reason why you, as a consumer, you need to observe, to monitor your API consumption. Because if you see a new header that something must be wrong or something, it should be an alert saying, hey, something has changed. And if you want to be really, really kind, you have a sunset header. So the precation header is saying, at this date, no, you shouldn't use it anymore. Sunset is, at this date, it won't be there anymore. And when I say Boolean or date, of course, when, when you start using it, the date should be in the future. Right? <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah, well, tomorrow is in the future indeed, so... <laughs> You, you are an experienced developer, right? Oh. Yeah, 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 I see that. And, and, and this is how it looks. So now I'm using the V1, and I'm saying I will be verbus, verbus. And here it tells me, yes, it's deprecated. Again, it shouldn't be done. And this is the thing that you should use. And now you as a consumer, you tell your uh, developers, hey, perhaps we should use this one. And because I've created, well, I'm stupid, I can just do this. And, and now it works the same way. It's the V2, and normally it's the subtop version. And finally, the last but not least important step, enjoy. <laughs> because I believe uh, if you implemented the steps that I've shown you in this talk, when business comes for the V3, it will be much, much, much easier for you. Thanks a lot for your attention. I still have a Twitter. Um, I don't know why. Uh, but also, I have uh, Mastodon and Blue Sky. If you are interested about the code, uh, everything is on GitHub. But I'm a smart because I use a bit.ly uh, direction to check how many people did actually open the link. <laughs> uh, yeah, because uh, sometimes I have bad surprises. Um, and uh, though the talk was not about Apache API 6, if you want to see me next year here, I would be very grateful if you open the link. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> and we have exactly seven minutes for questions. So, oh, wow. I will, I, my, my, you will be second and you will be third. And afterwards, I won't count. So the question is, what's the uh, performance overhead compared to Nginx? And the answer is, you need to do your own monitoring. Because this question about performance needs to be done in your exact environment. Besides, I'm not super objective about it. Um, but though I, I, I come from the dev world, I was always interested about ops. And um, I was a, a Java developer, and I talked about Spring Boot Actuator when it started. So basically, it's a set of endpoints that you can add to any Spring Boot application. And basically, it, it gives you monitoring endpoint to your app. And this question, every time I did this talk, every time somebody, how, how much performance is impacted? And my favorite answer after a time was, you know what? Is it better to go very, very fast 
and not knowing where you go or to be a bit slower and to be able to monitor. I, I'm afraid that it depends what you value. So as a developer on regular application, business application, not Google, not Amazon, not whatever, I value maintainability a lot more than performance. Performance, I can always add a new machine. It will be cost me, hey, what, $1,000 per month? Hey, okay, I can live with that. Maintainability, on the other end, in most organizations that I've worked in, was crazily complicated. So, first, what do you value more? And then if you want really about performance, you need to do your own benchmarks in your own environments on your own infrastructure. Because otherwise I can throw you numbers, it means nothing. Other questions here, there was a question here. It was the same question. Okay, great. Third question. I couldn't stop thinking as you deal with uh, breaking changes. That the, when uh, a client comes to you with a call on uh, E1, you send you some parameters, you forward to V2, and uh, that V2 knows that you come from V1, so you can adapt the answer to a V1 client that doesn't know anything about you. So the question is about breaking changes. Indeed, in this, in this demo, I didn't handle breaking changes at all, because guess what? It cannot be automated. The only thing that you can do regarding changes and breaking changes is at the beginning to have a very flexible schema that allows optional fields. Hmm? And then you can have security issues because people send actually stuff that you don't want to receive. What you can do also, though I wouldn't recommend it in the long run, is the API Gateway can handle some of the changes so they can rewrite, but it's not a great idea. Because if you start doing it as a temporary fix, <laughs> then two years later it will be like company policy. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I would recommend to handle the breaking changes yourself. And for that, eh, sorry, for that. Other, yeah? So does the API gateway like accept control downtime? I'm not sure I understand. Oh yeah, you just remove the routes for the time and then you bring it up again. No, you. Uh, I, I'm afraid no. I'm afraid you will need to bring on your own script to do that, to schedule something, but then you can schedule the calls that I've shown you, so you can remove the routes, so you send a, 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 a delete request, a request, sorry, uh, to, uh, to, API, to API 6 and then you, you bring it up again. I was not familiar with this ID. So basically you are warning people that, hey. It's like if you haven't listened to the emails or messages, mm -hmm. you, it, you actually cut it off for an hour, that way something breaks and people yeah, are interesting ID. I'll pay attention. <laughs> no, it's a great I, 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 I was not familiar with the concept, thanks. So no, we don't have that. You need to handle it uh, in a scheduling engine, but then you can uh, schedule the, the calls to add and remove the routes. Oh, no, you just keep it and you disable it. Sorry, it's even better. Uh, yeah? What do you prefer after the API uh, uh, expires? I mean, uh, you want to shut down the API, so what do you prefer to return as a response for just follow for or whatever? So the question is after I remove the routes, what? No, I, I want to re remove nothing. I, I, well, I want the routes to be gone entirely. And in general, the gateway, if there is nothing behind, we return a 404. So that's what natural. That's what I would do, like default. I, I, I like to keep my, my life simple, as simple as possible. Of course, of course, they would call. But that's good. the good thing is now I'm a developer advocate, so I don't deal with that crap. <laughs> you should think about it, right? 
<coughs> for 17 years I was doing consultancy. Hmm? Other questions? Ah, sorry. Ah, hey, come on. Hey, you were seated there. You are the ops guy. Okay, so the question is, is it only a mapping one request in multiple requests, uh, one request out, one response, or you can like make multiple calls? And the, the answer is by default is a one-to-one, -one, but there is a plugin, because everything is a plugin called Batch, where actually you can make, uh, your, your client can make a single call to the API Gateway, and the API Gateway makes multiple calls, which in, in microservices world is much, much better. For example, imagine you are in an e-commerce scenario, and you want to get a lot of data from different mi microservices on your uh, homepage. So you will need to call, I don't know, the news, and you want to call uh, the products, and you want to call, I don't know, like availability. So you will need to make three uh, parallel calls. You don't want to make them from the client itself because otherwise you will need to go to the infrastructure and back. So it's much better to keep the latency down to make a single request to the API gateway and the API gateway will make the three calls. That was the idea of your, of your yeah. So yeah, it's entirely possible. It's called the batch plugin. And then it's up to the client to uh, like read the entire payload and, and to uh, like dispatch. No more time, but it's the last talk of the day, so I will be there. Thanks a lot for your attention. Enjoy the rest of FOSDEM. <laughs>